Privacy, security, and ethics. When we surf the internet today, uh, and we go to Amazon, Facebook, uh, etc., uh, what happens here is each of these databases that they work with uh, can be uh, coalesced into big data. Uh, what happens is that when you visit these various websites, um, like Amazon, you can get what's known as, or Amazon will push what onto your PC? They'll push a cookie down to your PC. All right, uh, specifically a, f a first party cookie. All right, sometimes Amazon or Facebook uh, may have advertising on their website correct that's how they that's one of the ways that they support themselves in giving you a so-called free service well, these advertisers have what are known as third-party cookies okay that's how advertisers keep track of your web activity as you move from one site to another because if you're purchasing or looking for um, shoes on Amazon and they've got third-party cookies here. When you go to Facebook, you may see advertisements for shoes. All right. uh, what happens is that all this data that's being collected from information resellers and brokers, where an information reseller collect and sell personal data about you, okay, from stuff like cookies that they use to collect on you it's all being coalesced okay from all these different databases into this big data that can be sold back to someone like Amazon or Facebook in order to so-called better service you all right these create what are known as big data but electronic profiles of you Okay, so this big data is uh, basically a composition of electronic profiles of various uh, individuals. Some of the downfalls uh, through this could be what's known as a mistaken identity. Uh, your name and with it could be associated with a social security number in which someone entered in, you know, to the numbers uh, by accident through a trans transposition error they flipped the numbers and the number they flipped on represented an actual individual who perhaps has a lot of debt associated with them and thus you can't get approved for uh, purchasing a new home or something until you get it cleared up in terms of private networks within your own network uh, you could have employee monitoring software at your particular organization where uh, your employer is monitoring um, the different websites that you're going to literally uh, knowing what you're doing when you're doing it um, when you're on the internet and web a lot of times you may feel that you have the illusion of anonymity uh, that you, you feel an, uh, anonymous when you're making posts on uh, some blog somewhere and, and perhaps you used an anonymous name some, somehow but that uh, anon anonymity uh, isn't so because uh, you, you you have an IP address and not only do you have a unique IP address uh, you also have a unique MAC address uh, in which uh, some individuals who were able to master IP address uh, were later discovered in certain cases. What are some of the things that you can do to perhaps create a more private area or create more privacy, privacy for yourself um, is that you need to recognize uh, that wherever you go besides the Mac and the IP address 
You're also creating history files on your PC. These files and temporary files are cached okay, on your PC, basically letting people know, uh, or they're not letting people know per se, but uh, they could allow someone to know if they had access to it. Um, which websites you've been going to, etc. Because these websites could also leave cookies on your PC that we talked about before, these third party and first party cookies. Uh, to reduce that footprint, you can use the privacy modes for multiple browsers. Uh, for instance, um, a privacy mode from Google Chrome has an incognito mode that will ensure that uh, these things, these history files, what's cached on your hard drive, etc., these cookies, uh, they're deleted once your session is over. Okay. Uh, there's also a term called web bugs. Uh, web bugs are interesting uh, in it that they're invisible images or HTM code hidden within a web page or an email address that can be used to transmit information without your knowledge. For instance, if you open up an email containing a web bug, information is sent back to the source bug. This is how perhaps a server knows that, or how someone would know that your email address is active. And if that's the case, um, your email address will then be sold to someone. Uh, other privacy issues in terms of the internet and the web uh, is, is spyware. Uh, you may have spyware through your organization, through employee monitoring software to where um, that spyware could be a key logger, okay? Or it could be a key logger that was installed through you visiting a, an awkward website where uh, everything you're typing in is being recorded, including your passwords to certain websites. In terms of online identity, this is just a phrase and term meaning uh, the information that you typically volunteer to post about yourself on social networking sites such as Facebook or uh, LinkedIn or uh, etc. And it's important to be aware of what it is that you're posting out there since that and the information that's being collected about you can be coalesced together. Because of all this uh, information that's out there, um, you know, as you can see, uh, anything from the various places that you go throughout a city can all be tracked. Uh, certain laws have been passed, such as the Graham Leachy Billy Act, uh, which are laws to protect, uh, protect your personal financial information. HIPAA laws, which are uh, supposed to protect your uh, medical records and FERPA laws uh, that are supposed to protect your educational records. Security. Cybercrime or computer crime is any criminal offense that involves a computer and a network. Let's look at some uh, categories of cybercrime, you have identity theft, which is the illegal assumption of someone's identity for the purpose of economic gain. All right, so someone pretends to be you and goes on a splurge with, your credit, with credit cards that are written under you. Uh, you have internet scams. Uh, scams and deceptive act using the internet to trick people into spending their money and time for no gain. That's known as an internet scam, uh, such as mass mailing something uh, that says, hey, I need help. If you just give me some money, I'll be fine, and then I'll repay you in some way, form, fashion. Uh, you also have 
what's known as data manipulation. Our text defines data manipulation as an unauthorized access to a computer network and copying files to and from a server, where this can be as simple as making a post in Facebook when logged in as someone else, or as complex as feeding a company false reports to change their business practices. There's also what ransomware, you've heard of this, where a company will uh, pretty much lock down someone's server and not allow them to have access to it uh, without, you know, a password from the person doing the ransoming. And then, of course, they require some sort of monetary uh, appeasement in order to unlock it. There's also a, a denial of service attack or dis distributed to where, uh, you know, you have a server of some kind and you have multiple PCs throughout somewhere that are working together to basically bombard the server so that it's busy and can't provide the function that it's supposed to provide. Uh, a lot of times uh, this denial of service attack uh, shuts down perhaps uh, an ISP provider okay, uh, or a website like Amazon. In terms of security, there's also a term called social engineering. This is using phishing attempts to where uh, you may receive an email or even a, a, there, it may be a website where they're asking you questions, questions that, that can be used against you, such as, um, you know, uh, an email saying, hey, uh, the bank has been broken into or server has been broken into, which you confirm via letting us know what your social security number is and bank account number. All right, social engineering can also be done uh, in person uh, in order to gain access to perhaps uh, what your password could be. A malicious software, basically malware software that's supposed to uh, do bad things so to say. Uh, you, we have viruses where a virus is just simply a program uh, that will have a payload that does something destructive. Okay, you can have worms uh, which basically flood the system with junk and slow it down. You can have Trojan horse uh, which basically disguises itself as a legitimate program such as a free computer game or a free screensaver that could carry okay, viruses and worms within it. There's also a category known as malicious hardware. Uh, in terms of zombies and botnet that can go back to DDDOS where each of these are basically uh, zombies, They're basically PCs that have been um, taken control of and do a particular task such as bombarding a server through a botnet because this is now distributed. It's not just one PC but it's multiple PCs because that's creating the botnet. Uh, you also have your rogue hot Wi-Fi hotspots. You may go to um, you know some service place to get your car service or a cup of coffee and you see like you know Starbucks or something like that and then you see something else that says Starbuck uh, and then you click on Starbuck to, to get online and then all of a sudden you're on a rogue Wi-Fi hotspot in which everything you do uh, your confidential information is being collected. Uh, there's also uh, you can also pick up an infected USB flash drive. Someone leaves a flash drive somewhere in an open lab that actually has a virus on it. So you need to be careful of that. Measures to protect yourself. Yeah, there's a computer fraud and abuse act uh, which protects uh, people by making it a crime for unauthorized persons to 
ever view or copy or damage data across state lines. Uh, you can use passwords that includes symbols, underscore, you know, force caps, etc. Uh, so that uh, your password can't be easily guessed. Um, you can make it more complicated by using a picture password uh, that accepts a series of gestures over a picture in order to gain access to your program. Uh, you can use biometrics. Biometrics basically um, an example would be uh, your fingerprint or your eye where the scanner is used to uh, match your fingerprint or your your iris in some way in order to gain access to a program. You can use security suites to detect malware. You can use foul firewalls to prevent uh, bad information from getting into your network and your PC. You can use password managers in case you have a lot of programs and you can't memorize all your passwords and you don't want to use the same password to help uh, implement uh, your different passwords when you go on those different websites. Another way that you can help protect yourself is through encryption. You can encrypt your email so that when you send email um, over a public line uh, that data is basically locked. It's encrypted. Uh, rather than it saying OK, it has some code that basically says OK, in which you need a key in order to decode it. Uh, you can encrypt your files, uh, both on your local PC and uh, as they're traveling over an internet somehow. All right. uh, websites are encrypted through HTTPS. You'll notice that a lot of times you have the Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure shown on, their, on your browser, which basically requires that the browser and the connecting site encrypt all messages providing a safe and more secure transmission of data. You can have a VPN if so if you're at home okay and you're connecting to work and you're doing that through your ISP provider on a public line. All right, for you to gain access here on the secret formula of Coca-Cola so to say uh, you're using a public line to look at it. Uh, you can do that because it's encrypted. Okay, that's what a VPN does. Uh, when you're at home on your wireless network so that people can't just sniff your data packets, etc., you can use what's known as WPA2. Okay, and this is, wi this is a Wi-Fi protected access which basically encrypts your wireless network at home. It's also important for you to have a disaster recovery plan. You as an individual should have a disaster recovery plan. Uh, you know, what will happen if your hard drive crash? Are you backing up your files? If you're an organization in Houston all right, and your IT is in the basement and all your servers are in the basement and it floods, okay, are you keeping backups in perhaps another area of the United States where it doesn't flood? and then you can use those backups to restore your servers if needed. Ethics and computer ethics. So ethic is basically a standard of moral conduct code where computer ethics are the guidelines for that particular code in terms of using your computers in society. Um, the very first thing that we're going to talk about in, on ethics is copyright. This is a legal concept that gives content creators the right to control use and distribution of their work. So if you were a songwriter, you, know, if you were Thomas Rhett, etc., and you wrote a song, you want that song to belong to you and you want to have control and use of that particular song so that the time you spent on it um, 
has tang has a tangible value to it in which you have access to that tangible value if others decide uh, to sing your song. Uh, software privacy or privacy um, privacy software privacy is the unauthorized copying or distribution of software. So if you wrote a program and someone else copied it and distributed it um, for free or for money uh, and you copyrighted it <laughs> uh, then that, that would be a software privacy. One of the ways to prevent piracy is through DRM or what's known as digital rights management. Individuals, corporations often use this to protect copyright violations because DRM is basically a bunch of technologies that are used to control access to electronic media and files. One of the things they can do is they can control the number of devices that can access a file and limit the kinds of devices that can access a file. In order to help and ensure that we do have computer ethics, there's also the Digital Millennial Copyright Act. This particular act makes it illegal to deactivate or otherwise disable any anti-piracy technologies, including DRM. There's also other ethics such as cyberbullying. We hear about this a lot with tweens and teens in the K-12 area. And then there's also what's known as plagiarism. We hear about that in the post K-12 area and the co college areas uh, where people perhaps more inadvertently, not purposefully, but inadvertently uh, represent other people's work as their own right, without properly uh, citing where they get their resources from. So today we talked about privacy, security, and ethics. Uh, to begin with on privacy, we talked about large databases and how uh, these databases, uh, this these databases that make up big data okay, on us through people reselling it okay, could be a good thing, it could be a bad thing, especially in terms of mistaken identities and how um, everything that you do has a footprint okay, at work, through monitoring software, through your history files okay all of it on your hard drive that are cached on your hard drive uh, to reduce some of that okay you may want to use incognito mode from Google Chrome all right be sure you have anti uh, malware programs etc that ensures that you don't have spyware on your PC all right obviously there are laws to help protect us uh, but we should be protecting ourselves by being careful of what we volunteer to post online, especially through social networking sites, etc., that we perhaps initially thought were harmless. In terms of securing ourselves, uh, we know that there are bad folks out there. You want to take our identity for nefarious reasons from locking up information that we need to basically enabling us from doing what we want to do. Uh, installing various types of malware through a software distribution or through a hardware distribution. We protect ourselves through passwords, through the government, through biometric devices in case we're not innovative enough in terms of our passwords, security suites, encrypting our data when we can, and backing up our data. To remind ourselves of the ethics 
of the work that we do. It has value and to copy it is definitely not an ethical thing to do. And technology is involved to help protect the work that you do that's copyrighted. To bullying and plagiarism that can take place uh, in the college environment. At least plagiarism can unintentionally take place. All right. And that is chapter 9.